Hello there. You are here because you are thinking about applying for, or maybe you've already started applying for, your Higher Education Academy recognition. And this is amazing news. Um, it's a really, really important process, either for uh, recognizing where you are in your career at this stage and really celebrating those milestones. If you're thinking about professional advancement in terms of going for a job or in terms of progressing in the job that you're in at the moment. And just in terms of giving yourself a narrative about thinking about why we do what we do. Why is teaching important to us? Why is the learning environment important to us? This is a really, really significant process to be going through. But when you start, and if you uh, are just looking through the HEA website or you're trying to understand it, it can feel a bit overwhelming to begin with. It can feel like there's lots and lots of information out there. There's lots of terms. There's lots of what feels like jargon. And it's quite hard to figure out, well, where do I actually just begin? What are the core things that I need to know? And uh, what are the core term and terms and terminology that I need to understand in order to be able to submit a really, really good application? And that's what this short video is going to be doing. I'm going to be talking to you about how easy this process can be to navigate, at least to start off. And I'm also going to talk to you about some of the support that's available for you in addition to this as well. So there's going to be three core sections to this, um, and the three core sections are going to be about picking the level at which you're going to apply to. We, today we're going to be talking about associate fellowship and fellowship. And you're then going to think about the dimensions that you're going to be speaking to, and that's essentially looking at the marking rubric. Uh, so, you know, what level are you looking at? What's the rubric? And then finally, what's actually going to be required in terms of you writing up documentation? So it's going to be three main sections. But before that, uh, I'll just talk a little bit about this and, and why are you interested in this HEA recognition? Why are you looking at it at this particular point? And there's a few reasons. Um, for some of you, you may be thinking really instrumentally and really transactionally. As I said before, maybe you're a teaching assistant and you're looking to get a another role. Maybe you're looking to get your first lectureship role. And regardless of whether you're going to be having a, a, a career in teaching and learning and education specifically, or whether you're going to be having a career in, that's more based around the, the research arena, Regardless, you're going to be teaching. You will be doing some teaching work. And it is increasingly being sought after that people have some form of HEA recognition and associate fellowship as a real minimum expectation of that. So transactionally and instrumentally, it's really important for you to have this on your CV. It's a quick process to go through. It gives you a few letters after your name, but those few letters actually do mean something when you're applying for work. But also in terms of it meaning something, uh, you know, the instrumental part is fine, but it means more than that. Um, and if you speak to anyone who has who has been recognized by the HEA, whether that's at associate fellow, uh, fellow, senior fellow or principal fellow level, they'll tell you that it's so much more than that. At the start of the process, it can start to you think that it's just going to be something, you know, a, 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 a a hoop that you jump through. But actually, once you get it, you realize the power of this process. And the power of this process is you are going to generate a narrative. You are going to tell a story about yourself, about who you are, about what you do, and about why you do it. And that why we do it is vital because we spend so little time thinking about it. Uh, what makes most of us you know, good teachers is that we're spending a lot of time thinking about what we're doing in the classroom, or we're spending a lot of time on that day, in that week, in that term, in that year, and then it all starts again. So we don't often give ourselves time to just sit back and reflect and think, why am I doing this? And what makes me good at what I do? So the HEA recognition process is an opportunity for you really to sit back and reflect on what you do and how you do it. And this will help you to reflect backwards, but of course, it will also help you to think about what you're going to go on and do in the future as well. So these are two really important drivers as to why you want to do it. And if you want another really important driver, it's free. Uh, while you're with the UCL, while you're with the School of Management, this is free to apply for. It costs a few hundred pounds otherwise, but while you're with us, you don't have to pay a penny for it. So this is another good old motivator for you to be uh, involved in this. Um, I've put a couple of links in here as well about other areas that you might like to look into. So you've got the support that's within the School of Management, but also within the university more widely at UCL Arena run a variety of events. And uh, they've got a Moodle page as well that's got some documentation to help you out. 
So I said at the start, we're going to be talking about three main sections, and that's going to be about descriptors, dimensions, and documentation, three Ds. And by the end of this, you're even going to know what descriptors, dimensions, and documentation means. So let us get to section number one, where we're going to talk about what level you're applying for and the key descriptors. OK, so overall, um, step one is about picking your descriptor, identifying your descriptor. And this is about picking your your level. And we're going to talk about two descriptors today, which is the AFHEA, Associate Fellow, and FHEA, the Fellow. And these are descriptor one and descriptor two. Now, there's also descriptor three and four, which is Senior Fellow and Principal Fellow. But today we're just going to talk about these two. And it's worth saying here, this isn't a case of it being uh, better and best, you know, that associate fellow is at the bottom of the rung and fellows at the top of the rung and you and you have to climb all the way through. The descript that you pick is the one that most accurately outlines the kinds of activities that you're involved with on a day-to-day -day basis. So in picking your descriptor, that will then define the pathway that you're on and it will define what comes next in sections two and three that I'm going to talk to you through. So what dis what level are you at? Well, if you're at the associate fellowship level, I would normally describe this as somebody who's perhaps a, a teaching assistant or someone that's really at the early stages of their teaching career. And they've maybe got one, two, three years of experience. Predominantly, their experience is, is front of house. Predominantly, their experience is working within the classroom. And it's working with students, it's using novel teaching techniques, it's about including students, it's about involving them, it's about bringing them in, uh, and, and really doing a great job of teaching in the classroom. So this is one where you are um, establishing yourself and you're developing your knowledge in terms of what it means to be involved in teaching and learning. So as said, oftentimes this happens in the first couple of years, uh, people that are at that associate fellowship level and um, people that have been through the teaching, um, the teaching programs at UCL, they will be at this level automatically. But if you've had involvement in being in the classroom, this is your, um, this is the associate fellowship level. Fellowship level, on the other hand, is where you are not just focusing on the front of house. That's still important. You're still someone who's in the classroom. You're still someone who's involved in teaching and learning within the classroom. But you're also starting to think about some of the backstage elements. So this might be somebody who's in their first kind of full time uh, teaching role, maybe an early lectureship, maybe someone that's um, been given a module or a couple of modules to work on. So in one sense, it can be someone who's working explicitly on that module leadership and module development. Or you might also be someone who's involved in teaching assistant work, but to a more advanced level. So perhaps you're being involved more in um, assessment design or module design or seminar design. So you're, you've got more of a, a, a say, you've got more of a hand in the backstage element as well as the front stage. And this adds a different kind of depth, a different kind of discussion, a different kind of richness to your analysis. Because now you're not just talking about what you do in the classroom. Now you're talking about what, how is that prepared? How is that decided? And why do we do that? So you're thinking here more about the pedagogic rationale of what you're doing and why you're doing it. So with the fellowship, this is, as I say, it's not that it's better, it's just different. It's a different level. So if you're not sure where you're sitting, if you think you might be between these, then the Higher Education Academy have really handily um, offered you a, a what's called a categorization tool where you can go through and you essentially answer a questionnaire uh, or you answer questions in a questionnaire. And it will indicate where you should be applying to. And if you're not sure if that comes back as inconclusive or you're just not sure quite where you sit and you've had a read through here, then please just come and speak to us and let's let's work through your let's work through your your idea. OK, so that is section one, which is identifying your descriptor, which is your level. And what we're now going to go on to look at is looking at the, the rubric that you're going to be assessed against. Uh, and then we're going to look at what your documentation is actually, actually going to look like. So here we go to section number two.
And in section two, we talk about our second buzzword, which is the dimensions that you're going to be assessed against, essentially. So we're talking about the dimensions and we're talking about the dimensions of the UK PSF, the UK Professional Standards Framework. And I can't emphasize how important this particular document is. Uh, this is this should be the centerpiece of everything that you do. Every question that you ask yourself, is it appropriate to put this experience in or this experience in? Should I talk about this? activity or this one, everything is going to come back to this particular document. Just like you tell students to study the marking rubric that they are going to, when they, they, they submit their work, you're going to be sitting there with the marking rubric and saying, have you done X, Y, Z? That's exactly the same with your higher education academy recognition process. When your work is being looked through, people will literally have these 15 dimensions listed out and will be looking at how well have you evidenced each one of those? It is as simple as that in many respects. It's as prosaic as that in many respects. So it's really, really important that you address this. And if you haven't looked at it already, then the first thing that you're going to do after this is that you are going to go and study this document. But don't just look at it at the start. Please don't look at it just at the start because you will forget it. I speak from bitter experience here. Um, you want to be looking at this at least at the start after your first draft and then before you submit it um, because it's very easy to go off on a tangent it's very easy to start writing about stuff that you think's good and you think's interesting that you think's uh, you know fascinating fantastic but as if it doesn't adhere to this particular grid if it doesn't adhere to these particular dimensions then that might not be something that's recognized within your work. So the, the application process isn't about just having been in the role for a long time. It's not about um, you know how good your character is. It's not about how good an academic you are. It's about how well you adhere to these principles of excellence that have been identified by the Higher Education Academy. So what you are doing is you're saying, here's how I do these things that have been identified as really important. Here's how I do these things really well. That is the core thing that we need to understand about this process. Um, and as I say, the, the most important and the most overlooked one. And as I say, it means that you can then start to think about some of those questions of, so, you know, if, if I have a question about should I include X, Y, Z? Well, what you're asking here is, does it adhere to the rubric? One, well, the rubric is... Uh, uh, or the dimensions are split into three particular sections. There's areas of activity, there's core knowledge, and there's professional values. I'm not going to go through every one of these 15 dimensions, and there's a document within the description of this video that really helpfully does that. But I'm just going to talk generally about what those three areas are. The first area is areas of activity. And this is when you're saying about what you do, about what you bring into the classroom. So this is all about your teaching practices. So when you're actually in the classroom, what are the things that you do? What do you bring into there? How do you create those environments? What sort of activities do you do use with students? How do you involve people? How do you include people? How do you encourage discussion? How do you encourage students to think about what it is that they're studying? So areas of activity is all about the kind of behavioral aspect. Again, the, the, the front stage, the, the, the conscious aspects that we um, can, can explicitly identify. That's areas of activity, A. So that's A1 to, to A5. We've then got core knowledge, which is the K criteria. We've got K1 to K6. And core knowledge is you thinking about, well, not just about what you do, but the overlap here is about what, how do you do it? So this is about what you bring with you, the knowledge that you bring, the underlying rationale of what it is that you're doing. So yes, you've, you put these particular activities in place, but what's the knowledge that you have that helps you to understand that these activities are actually good? So the core knowledge backs up those areas for activity. So it's about subject knowledge. It's about knowledge of um, pedagogic, pedagogic knowledge, uh, knowledge about teaching and learning. So what have you learned that can help you to design something that students are going to find invigorating, exciting, engaging? So areas of activity, then there's core knowledge. And it's about what you do and how you do it. And the final one is about professional values. And this is about asking, why do you do what you do? 
And earlier I said that the, this recognition process is important because it gives you an opportunity to think about why you are doing something. Why are you in this role? Why is it important that you are here? So this gives you an opportunity to really reflect on how you go about your commitment to these professional values, not just in terms of what you do on a day-to-day -day basis, but overall, how are you how are you defined by these values and what are your values? <laughs> Generally speaking, this one can be quite hard to, to identify to start with, because you, while you might be really aware of your areas for activity, you know, that's the tip of the iceberg. The core knowledge is something that you can be conscious of, but these values are something that underlie everything that you do, but might be a little bit invisible to you. So this might take some time to think about what is it that really drives you? Is it a passion for inclusivity? Is it a passion for uh, building relationships? Is it a passion for dialogue? Is it a passion for creating um, environments where students become co-producers of knowledge? What, what is it? But what is it that makes you you? So these are the various different dimensions that you're going to uh, that you're going to be looking at and you're going to be um looking at how your experience relates to this. And depending on what your um, what, what level you're applying at, depending on what your descriptor is, um, you'll be looking at these in, in different levels of depth. So if you are applying for the associate fellow, then what you're gonna be looking at is at least, or no, not at least, you're gonna be looking at two areas of activity. So you're gonna pick two elements from that. And in your documentation that we'll speak about in the next stage, in your documentation, you're gonna be outlining what you do um, related to two elements. You're also going to be talking about two elements within the core knowledge domain, but particularly you're talking about at least K1 and K2. So you're referring to um, th those, those, those first two elements that needs to be in your application. If there's other elements in there as well, fine, all good, but you need to hit those basic levels before your application be can considered as a, as a success. And you're also going to be talking about your commitment to professional values. So values are always going to be there. But for associate fellowship, two areas of activity, two areas of core knowledge, specifically K1, K2, and then the commitment to values. Now, if you're going for your fellowship, then that changes slightly. And we spoke earlier about it being a different level of richness, a different level of depth. And here, because it's expected that your experience is different and because you might have been involved in more of those backstage elements, you might have been involved more in module design, um, then what you're going to be looking at here is you're going to be exploring all of those areas of activity and you're going to be exploring all of those areas of knowledge and all of those commitments to professional values. So at this point, it's expected that all 15 dimensions are going to be included within your analysis. And you're also going to be talking about continue the research that you do. Uh, the, You'll be talking about how your work aligns with research that's been done in that area. And particularly, you might think about focusing on pedagogic research in terms of teaching and learning. How does what you do in the classroom align with what others do around the world? And you're going to be talking about the importance of continuing professional development. So there is a, a different level of, of richness that comes with that fellowship application, um, a, a roundedness that's expected that you're going to be exploring all of those elements. So this is the dimensions. We've now spoken about the descriptors, which is the level that you're applying at, and we've spoken about the dimensions, which is the, the rubric, essentially. And the final thing we're going to explore is the documentation that you will be preparing. All right, so this section is all about what you are actually going to submit. So you know what level you're applying to, you know what the descriptors are, you know what the dimensions are, you know what the rubric is, but what are you actually going to be submitting? Well, this is where your documentation comes in. And for associate fellowship and fellowship, of course, there's slightly different expectations, you know, as with the dimensions, there's a, there's a, there's a level of richness that might come with that fellowship. But if we start here with understanding what are we going to be submitting for the associate fellowship? And essentially, there's three main areas. Uh, the very start, when you download the, the template that's available for you, the very start just asks you about you and about you, your experience, just some really general things. But the three main chunks is about uh, a record of your professional activities, uh, narrative case studies, and then the references. So the 
record of your professional activities. This is essentially like a little contents page and it's you giving 10 to 15 examples of things that show in a very quick fire way how you relate to the dimensions that we just explored before. So you see an example on the um, on the right hand side here. So this is where you'd say example one, this is my experience of, of teaching you know, X, Y, Z module, and this is a particular activity that I've done, or this is a particular activity of where I've tried to increase inclusivity in the classroom, or this is a particular activity where I've focused on continual professional development. So you have this list of not everything that you've done. This is not a glorified CV, but it's you listing out in relation to those dimensions the things that you would say are most significant about your practice. So you're kind of cherry picking the bits of your entire career that you would say are going to be most appropriate for this HEA recognition. What are the things that are most appropriate that will most show how you are, are demonstrating the skills that are outlined in the uh, in the dimensions? So the record is definitely the place that you should start and the one way I would recommend and I do recommend everyone to begin is that you start with a list of those dimensions the ones that are most important to you so you know two of the A's two of the K's and then the, the professional values and just start writing everything you possibly can that fits in with that every experience so you're writing this kind of scrapbook you're putting it together and you're just picking lots and lots and lots of different examples aim for as many as you can aim for 20 aim for 30 aim for 50 whatever it is aim for lots and lots and lots because then what you can do is you can pick the most relevant ones you can pick the biggest examples and say that's what i would like to to show so the professional activities is essentially a kind of a, a shop window into you and your experiences so if someone were to ask you about what you do in terms of teaching and learning you wouldn't tell them everything but you would start with everything and then you'd whittle it down to the key 10 to 15 um, elements. And they've got 75 words that you can explain to me. OK, so that's the first one. The uh, second thing that you'll be putting into this is two narrative case studies. And these are 600 words, so quite short. The challenge here is making sure that you're nice and nice and concise. But in your case. What are two things that you've done within the classroom or, you know, in, in relation to supporting learning, teaching, et cetera? What are two things that you have done that you would say, here's how I am most aligning myself with these elements that have been ex um, explored in the dimensions? What are the two very important things that you would say about your practice? Again, think about in a job interview. You know, if someone would say to you, tell me a couple of stories about something that you've done. Tell me about a couple of innovative things that you've done. These are what is going to be your case studies. All of the things that are set out in your professional activities, they might not be worthy of, you know, like a full story, but the case studies are where you're telling a full story. So in that, you're going to be going over the, um, yeah, you're going to be introducing it. You're going to be using references and you're going to be mapping to dimensions. So you're going to be saying how it relates, but even more specifically than that, think here about impact. So think about the elements in your professional activities that have had the most impact. And that can be impact that you show quantitatively, or it could be impact that you show qualitatively. But what are the things that you've done that you can say, here's what I did, that's important, but mainly, here's why I did it, and here's what I learned as a result. Those three things is what makes a good case study. It's not just saying, here's what I've done. It's not descriptive. It is reflective. It's saying, here's what I've done and here's how I've learned from it. And here's what I'm going to do as a result of that. Here's how I'm going to develop myself in the future. So these case studies shouldn't be just descriptive of practice. The description actually in 600 words should be relatively short. What you want to be talking about is what actually came as a result of this. So that impact narrative is really important. And that applies for the, the associate fellowship as well as the fellowship. Um, you might like to think as well about some themes that you would not like to have running through this. Um, so maybe, as I said earlier, when you were looking at your professional values, you might have themes of, you know, overall, my emphasis is around building relationships or overall, my emphasis is on justice in the classroom or on creating dialogue or creating a sense of community. So picking out core themes about what it, what it is that you do. 
Um, and then finally, you're going to be submitting references. So if all of the work that you've spoken about in your record of professional activities and your narrative case studies is if all of that work is based at UCL, then you only need one reference. And this is someone who has uh, uh, HEA recognition. Um, so ideally someone someone above, so uh, fellow, senior fellow. So you only have to submit one if it's all to do with UCL. If it isn't all to do with UCL, then that's fine, but you'll need to have someone from UCL and someone from the other institution that you are referring to. So that's your associate fellowship. And then the fellowship, don't really need to explore much more, but it's just to show you know, kind of like different level of depth around this. Um, so you're going to be putting your record of professional activities 12 to 20 items now. So instead of 10 to 15, 12 to 20, still 75 words to explain, still exploring the similar things, what activities most relate to the dimensions. Remembering now that you're talking about all 15 dimensions rather than eight dimensions. That's why you've got more space. And then you're going to be doing three narrative case studies. So three stories that you tell about yourself. And that is the very important things. Um, as I said, it's the same as with the associate fellowship, but it's things that you've done, not just that you've done in a team, uh, but things that you have done. And you can be really kind of uh, uh, think about yourself here, not just about what you've done with others, but what have you brought to something? The, 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 this application process is an opportunity for you to think about you and how you've done it. Um, so that might be you know, new technology, that might be about novel activities that you've brought in, that might be how you moved online, that might be student support. There's a variety of things you could do. And again, if you wanna bounce some ideas around, come and talk to us. But this is about your documentation. So for each of the, for the associate fellowship and for the fellowship, you've got these three core areas, the record of professional activities, the narrative case studies, and then the references. And the references for your fellowship is two references um, as, as standard. All right, let's get to our concluding stages. So today we have spoken about the importance of your HEA recognition and hopefully what's come across here is not only how important it is in terms of that transactional sense but also for your own development and your own reflection and your own narrative not only how important it is but also how straightforward it is this is actually something that you can start preparing right now and this list here is just giving you a little kind of idea of perhaps a, a workflow. So the first thing that you're doing after this video is you're going to go and you're going to identify your descriptor. Maybe it's really clear what you are, whether you're an associate fellow, or whether you're a fellow. Um, if you're not quite sure, then use the fellowship categorization tool. That's your first stage. The next stage is you're going to start gathering some evidence. So you're going to go and you're going to print off or you're going to download the core dimensions. And you're going to look at the areas of activity, the core knowledge and the professional values. And you're going to start writing out really roughly. You're going to start writing out everything that adheres to each of those um, each of those elements. And within that, you are going to be thinking about how that might then turn into your record of professional activities. So what are the 10 to 20 elements that are most helping you to adhere to those dimensions? So that's when you're going to finalize that professional activities list. You're then going to look at what to expand on in the case studies. And here I asked you to think about the impact of what you do. So what are the elements that you've done? What are the stories that you can tell that have had most impact, either quantitative evidence or qualitative evidence for that? And within that case study, remembering, if you come back to the, the, the slide on dimensions, you're going to be referring to academic literature within those case studies. You're going to be referring to literature about what other people have done, about why you do this and about why where it's developed from, but about how it relates to a wider literature and a wider practice on teaching and learning. So make sure that you relate it to literature. And within those case studies, put brackets all, all the way through it as though you'd be referencing that say A1. V4, K3. So you're demonstrating throughout that case study how all of those dimensions are going to be mapped out. So we start off by identifying where we are, then we start to gather evidence, we create that record, we then write up our case studies. At the same time as this, you're going to be identifying who your referees are, you're going to approach them, you're going to tell them about what you need, and you're going to confirm your submission one month in advance. So this is your overall workflow. There's some items in the description that can help you out as well. And if you've got any other questions about applying for your HEA recognition, then please do reach out. We would be absolutely delighted to support you in achieving this goal. Great to see you. And I look forward to speaking to you soon.